Um, aloha and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Latham, delighted to welcome you to the first of what will be several events, uh, really on a regular continuing basis, uh, a partnership between uh, our parent community, our, our wonderful and, and really terrific uh, PFA, uh, and Punahou School, uh, looking at a number of issues which are of interest and importance to us as we try to create the best possible environment uh, to educate our children. Uh, we did some surveying uh, recently, and one of the things we constantly heard back from parents was a desire to know more about how we can best equip our kids and really best support our children and be partners in education of our children as they navigate this, this new technological landscape. And I've thought a lot about this, uh, certainly as an educator myself in, in higher education and, and also here at Punahou. Uh, and I've thought about it as a parent uh, because I happen to be the, the father of, of two high school aged daughters. And this is an area that I've also been, been wrestling with and, and wondering about and, and trying to figure out how to navigate myself. So I'm really very pleased uh, to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Linda Birch is the co-founder and the chief strategy and education officer for Common Sense Media. And some of you may know that Common Sense Media really is the foremost uh, nonprofit organization that has been looking at questions of how best to equip kids to, to navigate this technological landscape and to lead healthy uh, and meaningful digital lives. Uh, it's a remarkable area, one where there's been a great deal of work and development. And Linda has really been at the forefront of this uh, in collaboration with institutions like Harvard's Graduate School of Education, uh, with the Yale Center for uh, Emotional Intelligence. Uh, Linda and Common Sense Media have developed curricula that have now been adopted by uh, roughly um, 75,000 schools. Uh, and are now in place and in regular use by up to 850,000 teachers. Uh, and one of the schools that has adopted a great deal of the work and curricula that Common Sense Media has created uh, is in fact Punahou School. Uh, and so what you'll be hearing about is a framework that we are actually uh, deeply involved with, uh, both at the junior school, uh, beginning with kids as young as kindergarten, uh, and then developing in a more progressive way through the curriculum in the academy. Uh, and we're really eager to partner with parents, and one of the things that we're really aiming for tonight is to give you a sense of, of how the school is functioning, but also to give you some concrete tools and strategies uh, which we all, as parents, uh, will be able to use. Uh, so we're thrilled to have Linda here. She's really been a proponent, uh, an advocate, and, and really a thought leader in this work. Uh, Linda has a, an MBA from Stanford's uh, Business School, uh, a bachelor's degree in East Asian Studies from Yale, uh, and has really been, I think, uh, a proponent of a great deal of what you'll be hearing about tonight and, and learning from. So, Linda, thank you so much for coming. This is her first visit to Punahou. Please join me in welcoming Linda Birch. Delighted to be here uh, tonight, and um, I've heard about this school for a, a decade plus uh, as a community in which people, a, a diverse and vibrant and curious community, and today that all became very evident to me in real time, so you're very lucky to be, to be at this place. Um, I wanted to start by asking, you know, who is my audience? Um, let me ask, how many of you have kids in elementary school? And how many have kids in middle school? And high school? Oh, it's more even than I'd expected. And then how many of you have ever heard of Common Sense and used it as a parent? So some of you know. Great. Um, let me just start for two minutes and explain uh, who we are and what we do. We are a nonprofit. We're based in San Francisco, but it's a national nonprofit. And our mission is all about helping parents, educators, and kids themselves navigate the digital world in safe, responsible, and ethical ways. <clears throat> and we like to say 
that we do that in three ways. We rate, we educate, and we advocate. The rate piece of what we do is that it's, we have an online, almost like a consumer reports guide to media for kids and families. And we rate and review all kinds of movies, TV, books, games, websites, apps, from a child development perspective. So you as a parent can choose media that's right for your, your family. Every child is different. Every family's values are different. We give you objective information, and you choose the media that's right for you. Uh, we also do parent advice uh, to help parents navigate the digital world. You know, what's the right age to get a cell phone is the big one that everybody's always asking. But it's also about understanding the digital lives of kids. You know, what is TikTok? What is Fortnite? Uh, some of those kinds of questions that you may have tonight in the audience. And, um, and then the advocate piece of our mission is one in which we're big in the arenas where media, technology, education intersects on a public policy basis. So kids' privacy is a very important issue for us. Digital equity, making sure that every child has access to broadband and all of the positives that technology can bring. Um, and then we are very much the people who keep both the government and the tech industry accountable for creating products that hopefully increasingly in this world um, serve kids' well-being. Humane design is a big piece of it. The education piece of what we do is our work in schools. And we have two programs. One is a K through 12 digital citizenship curriculum that Michael just spoke of. The second one is an ed tech ratings platform. So we rate and review all kinds of ed tech products that from a pedagogical perspective that allow parents and educators in schools to select you know, the best math fraction app for fifth graders so that both parents and educators can support kids learning at home. So that's, that's who we are. And we've been around for about 15, 15 years. So I wanted to start. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about the technology landscape and our kids' digital lives, share some thoughts about what's new and challenging and some solutions as well. And then I would like to give you some parent tips. The last thing I want to say before I jump into this is that we also do a lot of research. So what you have is your handouts is some of the research that Common Sense does about media and technology usage of kids. And we look at trends over time. And then also topics that are emerging, like how are kids perceiving and receiving the news today is one of them. But let me take you back to 2003. All of you, you can close your eyes or you can keep them open. Um, and I want you to think about that year and what you were doing. That was the year Common Sense was founded. And back in 2003, there was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was no Twitter. The iPod was a year old. And Google wasn't yet a verb. So when you think about what has happened over the course of the past 15, 16 years, it's really remarkable, unbelievable. We now know that media and technology is affecting every part of our kids' lives and our own lives. It runs through the middle of it. Uh, they are on their devices. They are on social media. They have access to information all around the world and people all around the world, and all of that is both exciting because there's so much positive potential for creative expression and collaboration and learning and youth civic movements, think Greta Thunberg. Um, and then there are these challenges as well that uh, are surfacing in schools and at homes as kids. The walls between home and school have fallen down as kids move around with their devices. And so if we want to tap into all of the positive potential, that I believe technology has to offer. The corollary for that is that we, as parents, have to do our homework, get smart, and learn how to guide our kids through that world. And in our schools, we need to teach what we call digital citizenship. So let me take you through the technology landscape a little bit. Um, 
some of this will not be surprising to you at all. So this is our latest uh, common sense census, te tweens and teens. Uh, it's media and technology usage study. It was published last October. Uh, what we all know is kids spend a ton of time with media and tech and using screens. Uh, tweens, the average is about five hours, and for teens, it's seven and a half. When you look at smartphone ownership, it's increased dramatically over the past X number of years. Today, um, 20, about a quarter of nine-year-olds have their own smartphone, and about 70% of 12-year-olds do, and that's up from 40% just uh, four years ago. And the aging down of mobile technology use to our youngest children has also happened at kind of a breath, breathtaking pace. So we are no longer surprised to see a two-year-old swiping a screen and knowing what they do. But this has all happened very, very rapidly. This is really interesting shift in kind of entertainment. So kids are, kids are currently getting their media through their phones and through their tablets. So what's really interesting about this is that uh, video, online video viewing has doubled in the past four years. And it is now the favorite uh, form of entertainment for tweens. And online video really means YouTube. So YouTube is huge. This is what they love. They love the YouTube stars. Don't ask me to name them. I can name some of them, but not all of them. Um, and it's about social media. And when we talk about social media, we talk about uh, you know, Instagram and Snapchat, but we're also thinking about the gaming platforms which have become very social as well, like Fortnite. I thought the best way to kind of give you a picture of kids' lives is to actually have them talk to you directly. So I'm gonna just show this video. It should be very familiar to the middle school and high school parents. <laughs> I check my phone a lot. More than I can count. I check it usually when I wake up in the morning. Before school, on the bus ride to school. During school. A couple times each class. At lunch. Probably check it at break. After school. Walking home. While I'm doing homework. I'm constantly checking my phone until I go to bed. I have definitely been emotionally affected by social media, maybe even depressed, um, but it's hard to say which causes what sometimes. Sometimes when I'm sad, I like to communicate with my friends on social media and that really makes me feel less lonely. Yeah, I never really feel depressed or anything like that, just because there's always somebody to talk to and always somebody that's there for you. That's kind of a good thing about social media. On social media, you can talk to people, but like you can't really get your emotion across. I sometimes wish that it wasn't a thing so I could just hang out with my friends and play basketball or do other things like that. After getting my phone, in-person interactions, it's been replaced by a text and call and FaceTime. Yeah, when I do my homework, my phone is normally next to me, and I definitely do check it, and sometimes I get sidetracked. If my parents saw some of the things that I saw on social media, I think they would be very shocked. I've heard racist and sexist comments in comment sections. There's a lot of bullying, obviously, that goes on online, which is horrible. They will comment something rude with language that is offensive, and people make it very personal and hurtful. They just want to invalidate you and your feelings. I don't really wish for the days when I didn't have my phone because it just, it gives me so much, like, stuff that I, like, cherish. 
The thing I love most about social media is to stay connected with my friends. Over spring break, I broke my phone and I didn't have it for a week and everyone thought I was dead. It was just so impossible to contact me. I like to make artwork and write and so sometimes I'll use that as a platform to display my art. I think I really enjoy social media when I am discussing issues with like-minded people or um, talking about things I'm very passionate about. I think it's a mixture of everything that's on social media that makes it so cool. There's like the snap shows, there's Snapchat streaks. It's just something that's like a habit to do when I get on my phone. It's something new, it's always exciting, it keeps your attention and that constant turnover of adding new things definitely contributes to the amount of time people spend on it. So is that familiar to some of you? I mean, it, I, I think what is, um, I love about some of those kids, I love that girl that goes, there's just so much stuff that I cherish. Because I think, you know, what we have to understand as parents is these are young adolescents, I'm still talking about kind of tweens and teens, but they are doing the work that they are supposed to be doing as young people. They are supposed to be figuring out how to engage with, with each other and the world. They are testing out new personas. They are doing all of the things that we know from developmental psychology are normal, but they are doing it in a context that is so different than the one in which most of us grew up in. Um, where you have these huge mass public audiences where, you know, what you say and do can be copied and pasted and sent to millions. On the one hand, you can become a YouTube star through that. On the other hand, you can be bullied um, in a way that is just excruciating. And so it's a complex picture. And, and I think when we embrace it and we say, okay, this, this is our kids' you know, social life in part. It is the way they're showing themselves to the world. You come to it from a different perspective. It, it is less fear-based. It is less shut it down. It is more ask questions of them. What do they love of it? Where are they going? What are they doing? Why do they want to spend the time on these platforms? And so. I, I like to have them say it to us, because you can also see, they see the downsides. They recognize them. Uh, that one girl who's, who is sitting there saying, and I'm on it almost all the time, you can see the anxiety of feeling, I don't know if that really feels good to me or not. So let's start with that. Let's start with this is our kids' social context. Now, we have decisions to make about when they begin to engage in that, and that's an important conversation to have. But by and large, some way, technology is going to be part of their lives, and therefore, we have to figure out how to engage with them and then guide them through it. Um, I want to talk about the challenges, because I'm sure that is on many of your minds. And there are many around this new media and technology world. Um, there is, to begin with, access, unfettered access, to age-inappropriate content. There are ways to protect. There are modes in which to put privacy settings and filter settings. But most of them can be you know, worked around by the most tech-savvy kids. So it is, a, it is a world in which there is a ton of content out there. It is flowing through phones, through uh, YouTube, through social me media. And that means, again, a lot of conversations about your own values, what you feel is appropriate. Are there problems with violence? Are there problems with sex? Are there problems with porn? These are, these are conversations that you're just going to have to have. And beginning at an earlier age than you may expect. Um, Cyberbullying, digital drama, and hate speech. Uh, I don't know if you know this uh, TV show. It was a Netflix show that came out a couple of years ago, and it was one where it talked about a teen suicide. It was 
quite extreme, but it showed how social media played into it. Um, I don't really know how I feel about it being on uh, Netflix. We had a lot of discussions internally at Common Sense and with the people at Netflix about it because it was pretty much out there. But what I can say is that schools and parents began to have conversations about cyberbullying um, and understand it more deeply than had been the case for many years before. And so today, I think there is a much um, deeper sense of the spectrum of meanness and cruelty that can occur uh, in media and tech, and some better sense of how to, um, to address it. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. What is new, and you should know this because this is what uh, is pretty alarming, is that the rise of hate speech, um, you know, defined as really crossing the line around racial slurs, around uh, ethnic slurs, religious slurs, that is digitally facilitated is finding its way into schools. It's finding its way onto all these platforms. It's a difference. Um, it's not maybe surprising given the state of our civic dialogue in this country and uh, the adults in the room who um, aren't, aren't always behaving in uh, kind ways, but it is real. And so that has brought up a whole new piece of what we do with advice for parents. If your child is either a perpetrator of that kind of um, bullying and hate speech or is, is on the recipient end of it. But it's, it's real. Um, how do you help? There are some very simple tips if you have a, of a child that is um, currently involved in cyberbullying, um, a recipient of it. The first place is to listen. The first step is to listen to not get alarmed, to not take away their phone, to not call the school immediately, to really sit down and talk and listen and hear what's going on. Um, they need to think through the consequences for themselves of posting uh, mean-spirited content or a sexting photo that gets manipulated and becomes uh, comes back to haunt them. Uh, you need to ask them questions. Here are some examples. When you get to the point where you realize it's happening repeatedly, um, you need to collect the evidence. You need to block it. There are ways that the social media platforms explain how to do that. You need to take a screenshot of it and collect some evidence. And you do need to go talk to the school if there are groups of kids involved in it. Um, we need to prevent this kind of uh, behavior early on by, I think, from the time kids are very little, and this is what is in our digital citizenship curriculum, teaching them how to be kind, teaching them how to be upstanders, teaching them how to provide support. Um, what you find with tweens and teens is that at first they'll try to work it out themselves with friends. If it's on the spectrum of meanness and not really egregious cyberbullying, they want to try to work it out with their friends. And if that doesn't work, you want to make sure they come to you as a trusted adult um, to see how you can support them and help them intervene. Uh, next up, social comparison, OK? This is all about you know, curating the perfect life. This is selfies. It's image curation. It is um, the focus of many uh, girls more than boys, but boys too. Everybody's trying to look perfect online. And I think what's important about this is that you know, the effect on kids is they look at others online and they think, everybody's perfect. I don't look like that. I'm going to take 10 different photos. Um, they look cooler. They look better. You know, they may not tell you that, but they're feeling it. And 
and they begin to say, nobody's really looking at the real me. They may even be concerned that if they're posting those perfect selves, they're not really posting the real me. And so it's causing a lot of anxiety uh, and some de depressed self-esteem. What's important as a parent, if you have a child that is feeling that way, is you've got to, you can't invalidate the feeling. You can't say, oh, you're so beautiful, you know, don't worry about it. You have to hear it. You have to let them tell you what they're not feeling great about, who they are envious of, who they are jealous of. It's worth listening. And then you've got to begin to talk to them about, okay, let's get some perspective on this. You know, there's something called the duck syndrome. Does anybody know what that is? When the duck is floating along on the surface, but they're paddling their feet like crazy underneath. So kids may look like they're perfect on the surface in that photo, et cetera, but they've got their own issues. They've got their own challenges, their own, own uh, insecurities. Everybody does. Uh, you can kind of pull back that curtain of perfection as a way of saying it and talk about yourself and moments when you may not have felt like you were as good as someone else and say that it's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to be trying. It's okay to move throughout the world in your authentic person and, um, and you will have friends. So that's, that's another big issue today. There are apps that I talk about as stirring up trouble, and Common Sense Media has a, um, we have blogs and articles for, for parents, and the one that is most highly trafficked every year is 10 sites that your kids are going to that you don't know about. Um, and these are pulled from some of them, now you know about them, uh, undoubtedly, but they're, they're new apps that become wildly popular, you know, millions of kids on them. Um, and they come and go, and some of it is just total fun. So TikTok, how many of your kids out here are, are either playing on TikTok or asking you to play if they can play on TikTok? Okay, some of the middle school. So TikTok is, it used to be called Musical.ly, and then they merged with another company, and now it's TikTok. Um, but it's, a, it's an app that, where kids can essentially create video, share videos, comment on videos, and most of them are synced up with music. So that it's like a lip-syncing lip -syncing app. And, and it can be totally fine and wonderful, and kids come together and they can create their music videos if they're in a band. But it can also be a place where there's lots of um, sexual kind of uh, dancing to the video in a sexy way, or there are ways in which it uh, can be uh, used for bullying. There's commenting that is inappropriate that happens a lot. It's an open site. There are ways in which you can restrict it, and there's even a mode in which it can be used for very young kids. But it's, it's, a, it's an app that you need to, as a parent, download it yourself, try it, move around it so that you know what your kids are doing. And right now I would say it's one of two biggies that comes up at every single parent event. So the fact that not that many of you are raising your hands is probably an okay thing out here. Um, house party. Anybody know what that is? Anybody heard about that? House Party is a, a group video chat. And um, so as many as eight kids can be part of a group video chat. Actually, now they've got it so that it can mul be multiples of that. So it's sometimes 20, 30, 40 kids. Um, kids are doing it in a sneaky way at night. Um, they bring their cell phones home. They take them into their bedrooms. The very first rule that you should think about is no cell phones go to bed with you. And then they're waking up in the middle of the night and having these humongous chats, um, both voice and text chats. 
And so kids are you know, losing sleep, they're getting upset because they're, when there are not parents in the room or any adults in the room, things can go haywire. So house party is another one of those iffy apps that, that you need to look out for. YOLO is um, the newest of a crop of what they call anonymous apps. So this is actually within Snapchat or Instagram. And it's, a, it's an app um, in which kids can pose questions, a question and answer app, an honest feedback app. Uh, and they pose a question like, how do I look? Or do you like me? Or you know, think, of, think of any number of questions. And then it allows people to give their feedback anonymously. And guess what? When feedback is given anonymously, it can get pretty, pretty mean-spirited. So that's another one. There is one of those apps that surfaces every year or two. They end up, um, teachers typically are the ones that discover kids are using them, uh, just because there's drama that goes along with it. And then they get blocked and shut down in the school and banned. And the fortunes of that company tend to go down, and then another one pops up. It's like a whack-a-mole. So it's, um, it's a, an important thing to look at. Here's TikTok. At the end of this, those of you who want to, I have a great video um, that's, that is, what is TikTok? So I will share that. But that is what it is. And then there are things that you can do to make it safe. So, you have to make sure that tweens and teens use their real account because there's a restricted mode for younger kids. Um, they need to make it private. They can, you can limit the comment section so they can actually make the videos and share the videos but not comment on the videos. You can limit time. There are lots of controls. And that's an important thing to just say across the board. A lot of the social media, there are controls. But as a parent, you got to get into it and understand it in order to help kids set them up. <clears throat> Next up, tech addiction and digital distraction. Um, I love this quote. This was from doing focus groups um, in 2014, where teens said, you know, our parents think we're addicted to technology. We're not. We're addicted to our friends. And that's why we're on it. And I think that it helps you um, kind of reflect, too, on what I said before. This is their social life. But nowadays, both teens and parents are realizing it's gotten a little bit out of control. So, you know, parents are checking their devices all the time. Kids are checking their devices all the time. Parents are thinking that their kids are distracted. Kids are thinking that their parents are distracted. <laughs> Nobody's happy. People feel like they're at home. They're wondering, OK, you're in that room. I'm in that room. When are we going to have a conversation? I mean, more than anything else, when I'm talking to uh, groups of parents, you know, they talk about this. And they, they worry about it in a kind of almost a angsty, existential way. You know, what is happening to our children's brains given all this time they're spending with technology. Are they going to be able to create you know, meaningful relationships? Is this eroding you know, their ability to uh, be social human beings? And then when you talk to teachers, the teachers are saying, you know, there's digital distraction. I can't get them to focus. So everybody's talking about this. The good news is everybody's talking about it. And I do think. Um, this one I wanted to put out there, this whole question of sleep and being tethered to your devices at night is huge. It's huge, huge um, problem because kids don't necessarily put their phones on do not disturb unless you've asked them to do it. And then they wake up in the middle of the night with little pings and notifications and they're getting tired and exhausted and they drag them to school the next day and they're just not their best selves. We know that lack of sleep can depress mood. We know that it can lead to, you know, uh, academic performance suffers. So the best advice, the simplest 
most concrete piece of advice I give you to take away tonight, if you haven't already done this, is do not let your kids have their cell phones in their bedroom. Now that panics people because they're saying, well, I finally got him to wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning because he's using his phone as an alarm clock to get off to school. But really and truly, there are analog versions of that. Um, <laughs> You can have a real bonding moment. You know, when I was your age, this is what I used. Um, they may not be able to tell time anymore, but uh, I hand them out, actually, at, at uh, various events. And people are like, yeah, I want one of those. Um, and there are cool analog clocks, too. Uh, but that is really the most important thing you can do. So what a lot of families do is they have a central place where all the devices get docked. At night, everybody charges them. You decide the time of night you want that to happen. Is it 9 o'clock? Is it 7 o'clock? Is it 11 o'clock? Up to you. You know your kids. But it is hugely um, helpful. And it's a really clear, easy rule. And um, particularly with younger kids, I would say all the way up through middle school, uh, that would be my number one tip if I were to leave you with one tonight that uh, will help. And it also kind of sets a precedent for other things that you may want to set boundaries around and um, make limits about. Uh, I wanted to just show you this. In addition to the research that we do, the Common Sense Census here in the United States, every year we do the same study in one country globally. And we've done four of them thus far. And what I think is interesting here is there are differences, as you can see, but there are a lot of similarities, too. So this is not a US pro pro problem alone. Technology is global. This is everybody's problem, everybody's challenge. <clears throat> this is a very interesting piece of research that we did in 2018 on kids' social media social lives. And we would repeated the research from 2012. Um, and in 2012, we asked kids whether they preferred having face-to-face, -face, there was a list of various ways that they could interact with their friends, um, via technology or face-to-face. -face. And we were so delighted when we got back the results that said face-to-face -face in 2012. And because we were expecting it to be texting, social media. And so we were really excited. We're saying, oh, these kids, you know, they want to still hang out together. Well, 2018, it has flipped. It's not horribly, um, you know, it's not horribly uh, far apart, but it has flipped. And so kids are much more comfortable communicating on their cell phones via text. They will actually, in interviews, tell you this. Um, they sometimes say, I don't have the language in the moment to actually have a conversation. Now, plenty of kids certainly know how to do that inside and out, and many of yours, I'm sure, are those kids. But there's this new sense of, oh, it's easier just to text. I can compose my thoughts a little bit more. Um, but it also means that they're being asked to respond to texts constantly. So kids feel that. If they get a text and they don't respond within a few minutes, they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. It might destroy a friendship. And that tension, that needing to always be on and respond is really stressful. Uh, there's a dawning realization, even among kids, that the tech industry is not neutral in this whole equation. That these products are being designed to keep kids addicted and hooked to them. Whether we're talking about likes, or we're talking about pings, or continuous scroll, or autoplay, or how, how many of your kids use Snapchat? Um, the whole idea of snap streaks, whereby a kid needs to send a snap, which is a little photo that disappears to a friend, and they need to send one back. And if, and if they have a 
if they do that within 24 hours, they have a snap streak. And then kids try to keep the snap streak going for as long as possible, and it becomes kind of a badge of <clears throat> friendship. So, you know, we're redefining kids' friendship and intimacy by the number of snap streaks, the length of their snap streaks. Not, not anything they would have designed on their own. The industry is designing that. So kids are being manipulated. And when you recognize that and you understand the science behind um, you know, this persuasive technology that keeps them hooked and you have conversations with your kids about it, no teen wants to be duped. You know, no teen wants to feel like they're being manipulated by anyone. And you end up having a very different conversation about how to disengage with technology when you get into the, you know, that was designed actually to keep you on. And, you know, they're thinking about what you are going to do and predicting what you are going to do before you're even doing it. So that's an interesting tact to take. Um, and there are ways to, you know, outsmart the sneaky science, as we call it. You know, you can turn off limit not um, or limit notifications. You can set times with your kids and say, here's a time in which you can do Snapchat uh, to limit it. You can turn off the autoplay uh, on your Netflix account that keeps rolling. Lots of different ways to kind of make it a little bit more humane. Uh, do you know what grayscale is? Anybody know what grayscale is? Uh, there's a great video on the website that I'll direct you to at the end. But you can actually take your phone and make it go on to grayscale, which means all the colors fade away. Makes it much less addictive. Um, I do it myself when I am kind of want to be on vacation, don't want to see anything, any apps that will make me click. So there's a debate going on right now that all of this, all of this together uh, is leading to a mental health crisis for our kids. You know, there is good evidence that um, currently rates of depression, anxiety have skyrocketed. There's a correlation that's been drawn between the advent of the smartphone and social media and the rise in teen anxiety and depression. I think it's really important to note that it is a correlation. It is not causation. And frankly, there's a debate from researchers about even that. <clears throat> what I think is um, important to remember is that when we interview teens, and in some of our surveys, and I handed out one of those, the social media, social lives one, and you ask them, are they feeling more depressed when they're on social media or happier when they're on social media? They will come back saying more often than not that they're happier, that they're not depressed. And even there's a bit of a, of a more of an effect for kids who already have signs of depression or have issues on that. But we don't know whether or not they seek out the social media to comfort themselves around some of those issues or the social media is actually making them feel worse. So, you know, it depends. It can be wonderful and great, and it can be lousy. It can make kids feel lousy. It depends on what they're doing. It probably cycles many times in a day between, you know, I think this is wonderful and it's making me feel great, and you know what, I wish I hadn't posted that thing, or I wish I hadn't seen the fact that my group of friends is off having fun <laughs> and I'm being left out. So um, my sense of this is that we shouldn't get too alarmed, but we should pay attention. I, I think there needs to be more research. I, I like to say, you know, we are conducting the world's greatest social experiment on our children in real time and we don't know how it's going to turn out. But we can't really wait to find out how it turns out. We have to use the best skills that we have today, parenting skills, the best ways of embracing technology and understanding it, and help to guide our kids.
this was just to say, these are the things that you may have heard about. Does everybody know what FOMO is? The fear of missing out. Uh, that's, that's that sense of, I cannot put my phone down because if I do, something may be going on and people may be going off to a party or a movie or there may be a conversation that I could be part of it that I want to be car part of and if I'm not on my phone, I'm going to miss out. And then I'm not going to have as close friendships with the people that I really care about. That's what FOMO is all about. <clears throat> Uh, this, this boy, I think, um, put it in a really interesting way. You know, he says, it's really stressful. It's hard to have peace of mind and to truly relax because even if you're not looking at your phone, even if it's on the table, you know that there's a message or an experience waiting to be answered or joined. It's like a parallel universe you walk around Within, it's in your head every day. And that, to me, is profound. Um, and we need to be sensitive and empathetic and aware, as the important adults in our kids' lives, that that may be what they're going through. We need to pose questions. We need to just check in. We need to know that it's a different world. We weren't dealing with this. You know, we might have been on the phone, but then we got off the phone, and I don't think we thought about the phone that much. Um, you know, they're walking around thinking ping, ping in their head. I mean, I just, I, just visualizing it makes me tired. Um, <laughs> and uh, what I think is really important in all of this, uh, this is uh, Vivek Murthy, who is uh, the former U.S. Surgeon General in Obama's administration. He's coming out with a book about loneliness, which he says is one of the biggest public health crises of our time. And the way that he puts it is, you know, the role of technology is important in all this. Kids may be depressed because of the climate crisis. They may be depressed because of the divisiveness of our society. But technology is also a piece of it. And what we need to do is make sure that it's working to connect us better um, than make us feel depressed and push us further apart. And so I think as kids learn the skills to use media and technology safely and responsibly and wisely and to treat each other well um, in this digital age, they're going to, I believe that they're going to invent and create a world that they want to live in and that will be better. Um, and so that's what the digital citizenship curriculum that we spoke of today um, is all about. It's a K through 12 digital citizenship curriculum, and uh, it's in all these schools, yours included. Uh, these are the six core topics, you know, how to find healthy media balance in your life, how to recognize that you have a digital footprint what you post online stays there um, and, and will follow you, perhaps, <clears throat> into the future. To be um, stand up, be kind and courageous in the way in which <clears throat> you use media with people. Uh, protect your privacy and also respect the privacy of others. One of the big things that has changed, even in the past five to six years, of kids using technology is that, you know, they're, they're co-creating their digital footprints. It's not just my digital footprint. They are taking group photos. They are tagging their friends in photos. So their friends are helping to create their digital footprint as well. And so they need to think about protecting their own privacy but respecting the privacy of others. Um, and they need to know the power of their words and actions, how to have civil online discourse. We didn't talk about it as a challenge, but it is one that I spoke of this morning here in schools, the whole challenge of misinformation and fake news and how do we help kids become critical uh, consumers of news when most, of, most kids 
middle school and high school kids are getting their news from social media. Um, <clears throat> so there are lots of ways in which we're helping to curate that in schools. The approach that we take is one where we call it the rings of responsibility. You start with yourself and think about all of those topics in the context of yourself, but then in the context of your family and friends, and then your community as a whole. Whether you're talking about a school community, a nation, the world, you know, trying to create the new norms of conduct that um, make this all work better for, for us. And then the other piece of the curriculum is about what we're calling helping to develop habits of mind and dispositions. So it's great to be able to teach a kid how to create a, a safe password. But when they're in a digital situation that's tricky, a thorny one, that's probably more about behavior and decision making, like getting a request to sext at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, what is going to help them practice the ways of slowing down, reflecting, taking some perspective about what they want to do and be their best self. Those are things that need to be taught. It's not enough to, our old curriculum we used to have pause and think and self-reflect before you self-reveal, but you have to teach kids how to do that. And so now throughout the curriculum there are these thinking routines that whoops, I guess I didn't put it in there, huh? Um, that are being practiced in the context of a, you know, a tricky digital situation. So perhaps it's sexting, perhaps it's how do I, um, I'm feeling smothered by my friend who texts me all the time, how do I disengage and set some boundaries without making them feel like they're not my friend anymore? Those are the, those are the tough challenges that uh, kids are going through today that the curriculum is going to help them with. And then we have lots of resources for parents. The curriculum itself has activities that kids come home with to do with you. Uh, one's about you know, figuring a way how to disengage from your media. Um, they become the experts with you and it leads to really interesting conversations. Uh, in high school, the uh, round digital manipulation and persuasive design. The kids are in some schools doing coding classes to create alternatives that are more humane design or in their history classes thinking about ways in which uh, they want to use social media as a civic engagement tool in any number of causes that they care about. <clears throat> so, they come home and they talk to you about those things as well. And then there are these very simple videos that explain what all these apps that I've just spoken about are and tip sheets and bunches of language. So it's a treasure trove of information for you and it is free. It is all free. Uh, the curriculum is all free. My strong belief is that this digital world that kids are living in affects every child. There should not be a paywall between any low-income kid and in a disadvantaged school and any kid that is affluent to have access to the content. So it is all out there for free to be used. And um, so here are my top line tips. I gave you some walking through this, but you know, set, let's set yourself up for success. Um, First of all, even before this, I would say, start young. You know, kids have these devices uh, at younger and younger ages. These issues, if they don't have them, their friends have them. Um, <clears throat> so you need to start these discussions at a very young age. Healthy media balance. That's self-regulation. That's executive function for kids. How do you say, goodbye to your technology is what you say to uh, a kindergartner. To a second, second grader you say, let's pause for people. Let's look up from our phone. Let's engage with each other. Can put it down, let's pause for people. Um, so you start young, you know your kid, you know if you have a kid that 
is impulsive. You know you have a kid that has a hard time letting go. You know have a kid that can basically toggle between lots of different things and they can be on media for a little while and then they'll go play a sport and then they'll come back. Everything feels in balance. You know your kid. Um, so think about what may be right for them. Do your homework. Go on to our site. Go on Google things. Figure out what this world that your kids are living in is all about and ask them to share it with you. They frankly, you know, maybe it's hard with the 16-year-old, but with a 12-year-old or even a 14-year-old, they want to show you the cool game that they're playing. They want to, they'll, they'll want to talk to you about their world. Um, use media with them if you can. So um, are any of the families in this room, do you have boys or girls that like to play video games? A lot of them? OK. Sit down and play it with them. Understand what it's about. Um, it's the only way you can have a point of view. Uh, and uh, Fortnite is another one of the biggies in, in schools. And we have lots of advice on the site about that. I can answer questions about it. Um, do set boundaries and expectations. Your parents, you can do that. It's easiest to do when you start younger. So device-free times, dinner, no devices at the dinner table. For some people, it's no devices in the back seat of the car. Um, when you're going on a trip, you may prefer to sing or look out the window or talk. Um, I had a rule, a bright line rule, that my kids could not text me in the house. <laughs> So, and this began, and you know, identifying those bright lines, you probably have a gut feel for when something happens and it's like, that is not okay. That is one of my bright lines. And I remember it, and it was really very funny. And my child was 15, he was a soccer player, and you know, I, get, I, I got a text, like, where are my cleats? And I was like, I marched in there and I said, you may not ever do that again. You can scream at me from the top of the stairs, which I wouldn't like either, but I'd rather have you do that than text me in the house. Because we're not going to become a place in which there's no communication. Um, the other rule that my son brought to me was no devices on the first floor of the house. That was very interesting. It didn't last very long, I have to admit. But it was a bright line for a while because he said, mom and dad, you're on your computers all the time. I come home, I want to hang out, and it feels like an office down here. Uh, and so that became a bright, bright line. So, you know, um, set some boundaries. Uh, we have advice about some that are important, but you probably have a gut feelings about them. I, I think kids who are big gamers, um, time limits, times of the day in which they can do it, uh, and stick to it, you know. You gotta stick to it, otherwise it goes away. And if it goes away, try it again, and try it again, and try it again. Uh, they will, when they get to college, I guarantee you, at some point call you and tell you that they were so happy that you set those limits for them because this other kid doesn't know how to get their work done and is up all night gaming. So I. I, um, that's a really important one. Uh, we talked about device-free zones. And then I think, you know, connecting media, which can be so cool and wonderful, to real life is another way to get balance. So whether it's finding something online that's an interest, um, learning, you know, the wonderful thing about YouTube is that kids can learn anything on YouTube. I mean, really cool things on YouTube. I remember when my child said to me, he wanted to learn how to play the guitar. And I'm like, oh no, I have to find another teacher to play the guitar, you know, teach him to play guitar. Within three weeks, he was learning how to play the guitar on YouTube. So find things that are um, in media. And it can be a place, it can be an interest, it can be a talent. And then make a point of saying to your kid, hey, do you want to go hear that music? Do you want to go 
to that park? You know, what would be fun to do that is somehow linked to the interest that they are pursuing in the media? Now, it may be they're looking at clothes they want to buy, and you may not want to say, hey, let's go shopping. But it, it is a very important way of making it feel jointly shared, online, offline life. We are in balance. Um, it can be good, but it can also not be great all the time. It's, it's all about those kinds of conversations. Uh, support the digital citizenship work in your school. I can tell you I was so impressed today listening to the Punahou teachers. Our curriculum has been out there for a decade. Uh, as Mike said, it's in half the schools in America at this point. I came here knowing that you were using it, but I had no idea how deeply. And um, it made me very happy and proud. So find ways in which you learn about what your kids are doing here in school. When they come home with the homework assignment, that is for the parent engagement, engage with them. Um, because we, as parents and teachers, have to be on the same page with kids. They need to hear the consistency. Uh, and there are ways in which you and your communities, whether it's a grade level coffee or some other way in which you're interacting with other parents, you can have these conversations about, you know, let's think about, let's think about some norms. What's happening in your house? You know, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have my kid dock their phone at the group docking station. It's a lot easier for it to work well when everybody does it. I've seen schools in which, um, Heads of school have brought all the parents in and said, okay, it's up to you guys. I'll leave you here until you figure it out, but figure out a norm in which kids are not on their cell phones at 11 o'clock at night, and they actually have created community norms around uh, cell phones and usage. And be a good role model. You gotta get off it as well. They watch us all the time. Um, these are the things that I just walked through, but in a little different. You know, if you're worried about your kid's balance, these are good questions to ask yourself about your kid. Does anybody want to see the TikTok video? <laughs> no. Okay. You can find it. We have ultimate guides to Snapchat and Instagram and Fortnite, and it walks through what it is. What are the issues with it? What are the great things about it? How do you set limits? It's all there on the website. Family media agreements. These are tools in which to have conversations with your kids about what you want your family norms to be. And the way I think about it is not as a you know, dictatorial agreement, but as a, a focus of conversation. So they, the kids actually need to kind of reflect on it and determine what, um, what might be the rules in your house. But if it's written down, it's on the refrigerator, you know, it, it tends to help. And um, device-free dinner. We have a whole campaign on how to have a device-free dinner. <laughs> Topics of conversation, um, a movement for happier kids. This is the website, gives you a sense of the ratings and the reviews and the advice. There are great, um, there are just great tools there if you have, want to provide support to your kids for homework. Uh, and, you know, I know it sounded a little heavy. I, I, didn't, I didn't think it would be quite this heavy. I realized as I put this together, I was so upbeat this morning talking about DigiSet that this feels a little, a little heavy. But my view is that there's a lot of hope in all of this. It is a challenging world, but we're all in it together, I feel. And I feel that you know, media and technology can be so wonderful. We have to make it that way for ourselves and for our kids. The tech industry is beginning to wake up. They've had a lot of pressure on them which I think is good, and we've been part of putting it on them, but they're beginning to make changes, things like the grayscale. There's a whole discussion going on at Instagram, <clears throat> at Snapchat, actually, 
um, about, uh, no, Instagram, about the like button and whether we get rid of the like button and that then changes the nature of social comparison and it changes the nature of kids feeling like they have to accumulate likes. And so there's deep conversation going. We can make this a world that works for our kids and that we'll be proud for them to inherit in the future. And so thank you for coming tonight.